standing firm on the solid foundation. I'll stay in the old time way. The way that believes in Jesus. For he makes lost sinners brand new. The way that believes the Bible.
Lord, I've come today to thank you, not for things you've given me today, not for blessings you have given, or the joys you promised are in store. So as I bow before you, give me the words to express my deepest thanks. Not for what you've given, but Lord, for what you took away. my guilt and shame, and all my sinful blame became a yours. You opened wide your hands, as a guilty man, you wore my crown. But most of all, thanks, thanks for, for what you took from me. Father, please forgive me for all the times I failed to mention this before. I've been so concerned with treasures, I went so far as to even ask for more. But you've shown me, Lord, what's precious. It's not the things you've given me today. For their worth to me is nothing when compared to what you took away. You took my guilt and shame and all my sin. As a guilty man, you wore my crown of thorns. You took the death I earned, and all that I deserved on Calvary. Lord, thanks for what you've given, but most of all, Thanks for what you took from me. You took the death I earned and all that I deserved on Calvary. Lord, thanks for what you've given, but most of all, Thanks for what you took from me. What you took from me. Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of Exodus. The book of Exodus. I want to speak on the subject the people God uses. And actually, it's a privilege when God fits you into his plan and he wants to accomplish certain things and he chooses to use you or he chooses you to use me. And in this present day, um, TV evangelism, uh, the average Christian often thinks he or she cannot uh, really be used of God because often the TV thrusts the movie star out in front, the football player, NASCAR driver, or some TV personality who maybe has given their life to the Lord and now they want to interview them and talk to them about their life. And, and you and I might sit back and just say, well, wow, um, what do I have to offer God? You know, these, these people are somebody because... 
the world knows them, or a reality TV star, or whatever. However, I'm reminded of the scripture in Luke chapter 16 that says, For that which is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. That's quite an interesting verse. That which we esteem highly is an abomination in the sight of God. Why is that? Because God wants to get glory out of our lives. And when we seek our own glory, um, it, it disturbs the Lord because we're here to bring honor and glory to God. So God's really more interested in using people who are not interested in bringing glory to themselves. Interesting. The world never sees itself as God sees it. So that's why God usually uses people who are, for the most part, not important in this world, as we would call important people. They hold certain high positions, or, or they make huge salaries, uh, or they hold, have great power. God sometimes uses them, for, but for the most part, he uses the average person. When Jesus ministered upon this planet, who, uh, who, who really did he minister to? He, he ministered to the common person. You and I. Just, just we go to work, we do our thing. Uh, the newspaper never writes about us. We're never on television or, or anything like that. We don't make news. And yet God says, you're the person I'm looking for. You're the one that's going to change this world. And we think, wow, God, I just can't believe that. And so I will look at this example this morning that God wants to use you just as well as he wants to use the next guy. And so let's look at what God desires in a person in order to be used of God. So those who, who God desires to use, let's look at some qualities that they have. He desires to use those who will allow him or God to get their attention. In Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 through 4, notice what the Bible says. We're talking about the man Moses. And Moses kept the flock of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian. And he led the flock to the backside of the desert and came to the mountain of God, even to Horeb. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And he looked, and behold, the bush burned with fire, and the bush was not consumed. And Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. And when, he, when, and when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here am I. Heavenly Father, bless the reading of your word. Thank you for these great stories of old. Because what you've done back then, you still do today. Still looking for the same type of people. We still have the same plan still want uh, to use us to bring honor and glory to you, and I pray that we will be available. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You know the story. The story. The movies have been made about the, the man Moses and the, the crossing of the Red Sea, but I'm more interested in his calling. How did God pick him? Uh, now we realize that he uh, had some great parents, and um, they hit him in a little ark, so to speak, hit him in the bulrushes, and he was, and God, in his sovereignty, watched over him and protected him. He was raised up in the house of Pharaoh, and then he made a mistake and had to flee Egypt, and he spent 40 years on the backside of the desert with his father-in-law, Jethro, who is the priest of Midian, thinking maybe this is his life. It's all over. You know, he, he grew up in the great era of the pharaohs, and he enjoyed all that, that Egypt had to offer. But he chose rather to suffer the affliction with the people of God to enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. And it cost him. He had to run for his life, and he is now watching sheep, very lowly profession. But God wants to use him. And for 40 years, 
There's no mention of Moses. He's just there. And we all of a sudden says, now God says, Moses, you fit into my plan. I want to talk to you. And so the Bible says that he appeared to Moses in a fiery bush. Now, how he, uh, God appears to you and I, it's up to God. God may not appear to you in a fiery bush. He may appear to you in a fiery trial. You know how God gets our attention? A lot of times in a fiery trial, doesn't he? He knows how to get our attention. Moses walking along, and he sees the, bird, the, the bush burning, and he thinks in time it'll burn up, but it doesn't. It just keeps burning, 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 burning. And that really caught his attention. And he stood there and watched it for a little bit. It still didn't, wasn't consumed. And then the Bible says that the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a flame of fire out of the midst of the bush. I don't know what you may be going through. Maybe God wants to use you. I know God wants to use us every day. If you're a child of his, God is doing something in your life every day. And you say, I, I don't feel like it. I just went to work. I come home, you know, I watch the ball game, you know. What's God doing in my life? Well, he's always, he's always working. He's always developing us. But sometimes he needs to get our attention because he's trying to do something that we wouldn't do otherwise if he didn't get our attention. And so maybe God is speaking to you today. Maybe it's a, maybe it's a trial of some kind. What, why does God allow this to happen? Why does God <clears throat> allow something to happen to me? And I say, God, why did this happen? And God speaks back in your heart and he says, I'm trying to do something and I need you. Now, it may simply be something as simple as improving my character or your character. I'm faced with this trial. I get angry. Uh, or you say something you shouldn't say. Or you get mad at the person who, who caused the thing to happen. Uh, whatever it is, this trial comes and we say, God, what are you doing? And God says, I'm improving you. And you need to go through this at, and you need to go through it successfully. And so we, we take a pause and we say, God, help me. I'm so angry over this thing. I'm so mad. And so God says, good, I'm developing your character. I want to improve you. And I want you to understand your, your anger or your hatred or whatever it might be, your lack of trust in me, whatever it might be. I want that changed. Uh, I want a better quality in your life. And so maybe in and through it all is simply God says, I'm developing character in your life and I need to talk to you through this event. Also, he may want you to understand what others go through. Sometimes we just need to go through something difficult so we can understand what other people go through so we can relate to them. And we can say, here's what God did in my life. Here's how God got me through the very same thing that you're going through. And so God has to deal with us in some of these, these events. But he first has to get our attention so that we know he's trying to communicate to us. Sometimes he may just want you to learn to trust him more. It's not easy to trust God, especially when you don't see what he's doing. You lose that job. You need the income. Somebody in your family is mad at you. You say, God, I don't understand this. God says, yeah, I want you to just keep trusting me. I want you to know that I'm there. I'm with you every step of the way. But I'm allowing this trial to come into your life simply to get your attention so you and I can communicate and understand one another. You see, the important issue is whether we care what he's trying to tell us. You see, some people don't care. In other words, I don't care what God's trying to tell me. I, I'm not interested. And that's really sad. Moses 
said, wait a second. I'm going to go and look at this thing. God got his attention, and he wanted to see what the deal was. God works in your life as well, in my life. Works in everybody, especially if you're a child of God. Give him your attention. Say, God, are you trying to tell me something here? Is there something that you want me to change or do, take on, uh, some alteration in my life? What is it, God? And use those moments where God speaks to you and gets your attention to listen to God. Notice what God says. No, he, uh, Moses says, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush is not burnt. So he understood that something's going on here he doesn't quite understand. So God got his attention. Secondly, notice, because God wants to do something in and through Moses' life. Secondly, he uses those who will answer the call. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see God called unto him out of the midst of the bush and said, Moses, Moses, and he said, here am I. I find it fascinating that the angel of the Lord came down, and the next thing is it says that God is speaking through the bush. It's actually God in the bush. And it's probably a Christophany where it's, it's Christ in the Old Testament appearing, uh, and he's talking to Moses. There are three in the Godhead, all right? God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. All three of them are God. And so the angel of the Lord descended. God is now speaking to Moses out of the burning bush. Once God saw he had Moses' attention, he then calls to him. I find that when we seek truth and understanding of God's purpose, he will give us more light and understanding. A lot of people right here, and I may pause, are not open to God speaking to them. They really do not want to hear what God has to say to them. Why? Because they're afraid. Notice Moses said, hear my. He was open to listening to God. I hope you are. Many people are not open to listening to God. He may get their attention through a hardship. He may get attention through some other means. But once he has your atten his attention, he wants to tell you something. And some people do not want to know what God has to say. They're afraid. Why are they afraid? They're afraid to open themselves up to God. Why? Because of, they're fearful of what he will ask of them. In other words, I'm very content with my life. I don't mind going to church, putting in my hour, and, and then uh, going on with my life. I can do that. But sure as anything, God gets involved. He's going to want more out of my life. You know what? You're exactly right. He does. He wants to be the Lord of your life. And so there's a lot of people who are afraid to turn their finances over to God. To put God first. Let him control their finances. Oh, they're scared to death of that. Afraid God might want an extra offering. Oh, I could and they're afraid. They're fearful. Why? Because God does not have all of their heart. Next thing is, God probably want me to attend more church services. You're right. You're exactly right. God, why does God want that? So that you will get into his word and you will understand his word. And in understanding his word, you will understand him. Well, I don't want to do that. And people are fearful. They're afraid to allow others know that they're a Christian. They want to be a secret Christian. As sure as anything, I know what God wants. He'll want me to go out there and let the world know that I'm a Christian. And I'm afraid to do that. You're right. God wants you to let the world know that you're a Christian. It's sad where we are today in Christianity. 
I tell you what, folks, for the most part, it goes back to the churches and the homes. I know they can kick, kick the, the Bible out of the government and they can take the Bible out of the schools. But all in all, if you've got a strong home and you've got a strong church, Christianity should still flourish. If we're doing what God wants us to do, if we're usable to God and people see us as lights in this world, we should be having a greater effect upon our culture and our society. And so, churches and Christians carry a lot of the responsibility. Well, I just don't, I'm afraid of what they'll say. They may mock me, they may make fun of me, they may reject me. We know what they did to Christ, and Christ did all that he did for you and for me. So if he suffered shame for you and for me, can we not suffer a little bit? But I'm saying to you, I'm afraid that God want, will want more out of me. And um, some are afraid to keep serving the Lord when they don't see any improvement in their problems. It's difficult to keep trusting God when things keep going downhill and but again, God says, come on, I'm trying to build greater trust in you. I'm trying to build greater faith in you. I'm trying to mold your character. I'm trying to uh, uh, get more out of you for, the glory, for his glory. Don't become fearful of God. God's going to give Moses a huge task here. But yet he, was resp- he responded, God, I, have, I don't have the foggiest idea what you want of me. But here am I. Boy, that's what God wants to hear out of our lives. I'm available. I surrender. Number three, God uses those who are aware of God's holiness. Notice in verse 5, and he said, Draw nigh, not, draw not uh, nigh th- hither, put off thy shoes from off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses hid his face for he is afraid to look upon God. There is only one God. There's not lots of gods. We know that God is a trinity. There's still God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. And they're one entity. Not three gods. There's one God. But I like what he says here, and he says it repeatedly in the Bible. So you get get mixed up on this thing because you hear it today. Well, all gods are the same God. No, they're not. Notice what he says, I am the God, and he qualifies the God that he is. I'm the God of Abraham. I'm the God of Isaac. I'm the God of Jacob. I'm the Jewish God. And boy, that turns some people off. I want another God. I'm sorry, you can't find one. There's not another God that built a, a mansion for you in heaven. There's not another God that provided the means of salvation for you. It's the God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. You either have to accept that, or you're going to trust a God that's not going to get you anywhere. A lot of people say, well, that's just too narrow-minded. Let it be what it may be. But the fact is, it's a fact, and it's the truth. And Jesus is the son of that God. And so Moses, this is who I am. And I want you to know who I am. And matter of fact, Moses, the ground that you're even standing on is holy ground. I'm that holy. The fact that I'm here makes this entire place holy. We've lost that in America. We don't respect God as being a holy God anymore. We are, we've become so worldly in America. Let me give you a statement. We live no better than the level at which we honor and, res- and, and respect and reverend our God. We live, we live no better or any, on any higher level than the level 
at which we honor and reverence God. You know why the world looks like it does today among Christianity? Because they have very little respect for God. He's just standing on dirt, Moses is. And God says, get your shoes off. Why? I'd just be standing in dirt. No, no, no. That's not just dirt. That's holy ground. I, God says, I make the difference. When you come into God's presence, you're coming into holiness. We disrespect him so today. Oh, looks across America. I can see why God's going to do what he's going to do. Because of the disrespect, no reverence, no acknowledging his holiness. I live however I want to live. And if you don't satisfy my desires, I'll just do something else. God says, go ahead. You'll pay the price. Moses, the Bible says, Moses hid his face for he is afraid to even look upon God. He's so holy. He pulled his shoes off. Because he's standing in the very holiness of almighty God. People joke about God. It's sad. We go on all day how they disrespect God at every level. They feel like God got a deal when they got them. We'll look at some issues about that. Matter of fact, let me show you where we are. Turn in your Bibles to Ezekiel chapter 33. God is going to punish Israel as he did back in the Old Testament. In Ezekiel chapter 33, and I was reading this the other day, and it brought to mind when I was thinking about this sermon, because it is... Boy, you talk about a picture of America today in, in the realm of Christianity. In Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 28, God says, and he's talking through Ezekiel. He, Ezekiel's a prophet of God. He says, for I will lay the land most desolate, and the pomp of her strength shall cease. And the mountain of Israel shall be desolate, that none shall pass through it. No, here's what I'm going to do to Israel. Well, what's the problem? Well, look at verse 31. And they come unto thee as the people cometh. They sit before thee as my people. They hear thy words but they will not do them. For with their mouth they show much love, but their heart goeth after their covetousness. And lo, thou art unto them as a very lovely song of one that hath a pleasant voice and can play well on an instrument. For they hear thy words, but they do them not. And when this cometh to pass, lo, it will come. Then shall they know that a prophet hath been among them. This is what we see in many churches today. Oh, they fill them up. People pour out. They go to church. And they think, boy, this is entertaining. Wow. Uh, I'm here, God, I'm, you know, listen, God, here I am, I'm listening. God said, but what you doing? Are you going to change? Are you going to improve? Are you going to act upon anything you heard that day? No, I don't intend to. But I enjoyed everything that went on. I enjoyed the music. I enjoyed the, the, the sermon. Uh, matter of fact, the, the preacher may have had a very pleasant voice. He, he made me feel good today and and God looks down and says, you know, I'm just going to clean this place out. You're going through the motions. 
and you're not getting the message. And so there are many in church today who have no intention of living as God would want them to live. Churches are full of them. They have no intention of changing. They'll go, they'll go to church, they'll hear the message even. But that's as far as it goes. What's he say? But their heart goeth after their covetousness. I'm going to do what I want to do. I want to go out and I want to have more. I want to have more pleasure. I want to have more possessions. I want to have more fun. I want to have more of this. I want to have more of that. Uh, God, I hear what you're saying, but obviously it doesn't apply to me. They attend, they hear the words, and with their mouth they show even much love. But their actions, God says, are just the opposite. Why did those people in Ezekiel's day feel like they didn't need to allow God's word to change them? Why would they do that? Because of the lack of respect and fear of God. It's that simple. They just didn't see that the way they lived their lives had any effect upon God. It's wrong, God, with the way I live my life. I'm satisfied with it, and I want you to be satisfied with it. God said, I'm not satisfied with it. I have a plan, and I want to involve you in my plan. I, 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 I see a picture of what you can be, what you can accomplish. That's why you even exist. And it only happens as you adjust your life according to God's word. Moses was well aware of the holiness of God, and he was afraid to even look to God. And I believe God can't use people who don't respect the holiness of Almighty God. They'll never rise any higher than their respect for God and his holiness. Number four, God uses those who are humble. Notice verse 11 of our text back in Exodus. The Bible says, And Moses said unto God, Who am I that I should go unto Pharaoh, that I should bring forth the children of Israel out of Egypt? God's looking for people who believe they can't accomplish what he asks of them. I'll say that again. God's looking for people who believe they can't accomplish what God asks of them. He can find a lot of people out there who think they can do everything. <laughs> God, you want, my, want me to build something big? Yeah, I'm the guy. God, God, you want me to change the world? I'm the guy. God says, no, I don't want to use you. Because you're going to do it in the flesh. You're going to do it for your glory. I, you're not the one I want. You go through the Bible. Look who God used. How do you, how do you find a king of Israel? Go to Jesse. Go through all of his sons. Oh, he's got a bunch of them. Go to the firstborn. Look at him. Go to the second one. Go to the third one. Go to the fourth one. Go to the fifth one. Uh, God, any of those going to do you any good? No, I don't want any of them. Well, Jesse, do you have any more sons? Well, I got one. Where is he? Oh, he's out watching the sheep. His name's David. Ah, that's the one David wants, God wants to use. But look at all these other fine sons I have. I know. Look at the Gideons. God, it's surely not me. Listen, God wants to do great things in and through our lives, and he doesn't mind you at all saying, I can't do it. But he wants you to be willing to try. Moses says, who am I, God? You got the wrong guy. I can't even speak. I stutter. I, I, yeah. God says, man, you're exactly what I'm looking for. Why? Because you understand you can't do it in your strength. That's what I'm looking for. I want somebody who will totally rely upon me every day of their life to accomplish my goal and my purpose for their lives.
You see, pride keeps us from being used of God. We all have it. We're born with it. It's part of the sin nature. And it probably is at the very root of our sin nature. So I don't care who you are, myself included, somewhere I have to deal with the pride issue. Where did it start? It started with Lucifer, didn't it? Why was he kicked out of heaven? Because of his pride. I'll exalt myself before, above God. I'll sin. And so I will, I will, I will do this. And God says, get out of here. And that has passed on to all of us. I can do it. I can, God, boy, I'll do it. You want it done right, God, you just call on me. God says, you're the last one I'm going to call on. Now, there's a lot of people doing things out there in the name of God, and they're doing it in the flesh, but they were never called to God in the first place. God uses the people who do not believe they can do it. That's why every undertaking, as I look back on my life, and I watched how God advanced me in different areas. I was frightened every time I did something new. God said, that's good. <laughs> I said, I don't think it's good, God. <laughs> God says, I like it. I like it. And so whether it's teaching little children, whatever it is, witnessing, um, you, you think of anything that God wants you to do. You say, God, I, I, I just, I'm, who am I? I'll mess up, I'll flub. God says, you're exactly what I'm looking for. So understand, that's who God uses. And so we we'll all have to deal with the pride issue. We have to battle it. And the ones who can defeat it with God's help will be those whom God will use the most. The Apostle Paul had to be afflicted in order for him to stay humble. You recall the, the account in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 7. He understood fully what God was doing to him. He was a man of talent and abilities and skills. He was an orator. I mean, he was, he was trained and groomed under the best teachers. And yet when God picked him, God could not afford to let him operate in his pride. So he had to strip him of his pride. And in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 27, the Bible says, But God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things that are mighty. The base things of the world, the things which are despised, hath God chosen. Yea, the things which are not, to bring to naught the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. So he says, I, that's why I do what I do. That's why I choose the lowly. I choose the less skillful. I choose those who are afraid but are willing to trust me to get them through that difficult time. Paul put it this way when it applied to him in 2 Corinthians 12, 7. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet me. Why? Lest I should be exalted above measure. He says, I understand what God's doing to me. God is allowing me to even be afflicted lest I should exalt myself above measure. God's doing it to stem the pride that's in my life. So if you're willing to do what God wants you to do, when you don't feel like you're able to do it, you'll be a winner. <laughs> I preached a long time ago on the paradoxes of the Bible. It's amazing. The spiritual world is just the opposite of the fleshly world. You want to be somebody in this world? You want to be somebody in this world? You go out and you, you strive and you do all this. God says you want to be somebody in the spiritual world? You become a servant. A servant? 
I don't think I get very far back being a servant. No, God says that's how you get ahead in the spiritual world. And there's all these paradoxes in the Bible. God says, I've got to get you to stop thinking like the world thinks. See, the world, see, see life as I see it. God wants to bless us with humility. Somebody said, if you worry too much about what people think of you, you probably will be disappointed to discover how seldom they do think of you. <laughs> Isn't that something? Oh, those people, they think terrible of me. No, they're not thinking of you at all. <laughs> oh, that's a shocker. I thought they thought of me all the time. Sorry. They don't even come to your, their mind. One of those points, Jason, I'm leaving out, okay? Let's go to number five. Last point. God uses those who are willing to be used of God. Verse 13 of our text. And Moses said unto God, Behold, I am come unto the children of Israel, and shall say unto them, The God of your fathers hath sent unto me unto you. And they shall say unto me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? And, and, of course, we see in verse 14, you tell them, I am hath sent me unto you. But my point is, he did what God asked him to do. Okay, God, you've called me to be the leader of all these Israelites, these Hebrews, and bring them out of Egypt. I don't say how I'm going to do it. I don't have the foggiest idea why Pharaoh would listen to me. But I'm going to do it. So he says, God, when I get there, when I come unto the children of Israel, shall say unto them, the God of your fathers has sent me unto you. And they're going to say, what's his name? What shall I say unto them? You just tell them I am sent you. And you just go day by day by day, and I will be with you. Because I have a plan, and I will fulfill my plan if you're willing to do it. Will you let God use you? Will you let him shape you into something beautiful? He, he really does have a wonderful plan for your life and my life. And all the while, he's busy working his plan. Sometimes he has to get a little personal, and he has to bring a trial into our lives to get our attention. What's he saying? Listen to him. You see, God's not trying to make life hard for you. He's just simply trying to get us on track. And then he wants us to be willing. Even when you say, God, I can't do it, God says, yes, you can do it. If I'm in it, you can do it. Maybe God's speaking to you today about getting saved. And you've said, God, I'm afraid you're going to mess up my life. No, he's going to make your life better. I'm fearful. Get past it. It's the only way to get to heaven. God loves you. God wants to save you. And if fear has kept you from giving your life to Jesus Christ, get past that fear. Ask God right now, God, help me to overcome that fear. And help me just to call upon Jesus Christ and make him this Lord and Savior of my life. God will save you. But God's working. He's trying to get to you. Others, he's trying to change us. Qualities inside of us. And he's revealing this information to us. Listen to him. Take him to heart. And don't pass it off and say, well, God, you know, I don't see the net need for it. Listen to what he's saying. Act upon what he's saying. And let God change you for the best. Stand with me, please. I'll stay in the old time way.
sing around the throne eternal as the saints all march around. To build the glory when I meet the Savior, he's the one who died for me. When I cross to the other side of Jordan, just beyond that crystal sea. When I cross to the other side of Jordan, over on that golden shore. When I cross to the other side of Jordan, I'll live forevermore. There'll be glory in the morning, for there never comes a night. When I cross to the other side of Jordan, where my Jesus is alive. I have so many loved ones who have made this trip, I know. Oh, how I long to see them as a journey here below. To hear them tell of heaven and the streets all paved with gold. When I cross to the other side of Jordan, I hear the half that's never been told. When I cross to the other side of Jordan, over on that golden shore. When I cross to the other side of Jordan, I'll live forevermore. There'll be glory in the morning, for there never comes a night. When I cross to the other side of Jordan, where my Jesus is alive. Well, when I cross to the other side of Jordan, over on that golden shore. And shore. When I cross to the other side of Jordan, I'll live forevermore. never been told when across to the other side of Jordan over on that golden shore when across to the other side of Jordan I'll live forevermore there'll be glory in the morning for there never comes a night when across to the other side of Jordan where my Jesus is alive well when I cross to the other side of Jordan over on that golden shore when across to the other 